Welcome to the Hollywood Outsider, an award-winning weekly entertainment podcast. It's always available on your favorite app or at thehollywoodoutsider.com. This is our Fantasia Fest recap, where we dive into one of the largest genre festivals in the world, complete with reviews of several film premieres. Let's get on with the show. My name is Aaron Peterson, and I'll be your host. Joining me today is my fellow host, Amanda Sink. Hello, hello, Aaron. Hello. Hello. This episode, we are going to actually talk exclusively about the Fantasia Film Festival, what the festival is, how it works, and especially what movies we saw that you should keep an eye out for. Yes, Aaron. So the Fantasia Film Festival, if you're not familiar with it, is one of the largest international film festivals. And it's dedicated to genre films, which are some of the best, I would say. And it's actually celebrating its 25th year in 2021. The film festival is located in Montreal, Canada, and usually they have a full in-person event. Of course, COVID has destroyed everything we we know and love. Stupid COVID. (laughs) They've gone to a mostly digital format. So that way, movie lovers, whether it's critics or just people wanting to enjoy the films, they can enjoy them for basically an entire month. It goes from August 5th through the 25th, or you should say went, and it includes screenings, premieres, panels, workshops, the whole nine yards. And this year in particular, the festival actually took a heightened focus on Japanese cinema in celebration of the key role that Japan's culture has played across Fantasia's history. So I think that was kind of cool, too, that they made kind of like a theme, but dedicated the this year, their 25th anniversary to Japan culture. Which is fantastic because so many genre movies come out of uh, Japan and and Asia in general that we don't really talk about often on a normal podcast because it doesn't usually get much heightened play here in the States, I would say. And it's nice to finally to focus on that, to actually take a shine a light on the on the culture, on the genre, the films that come out of there. I know my brother is a avid Japanese culture follower, and every time he recommends a film to me, it is from Japan every time. If it's from the States, I'm scared of it because I don't know what I don't know what the hell it's going to be, but I know it's going to be crazy because <laughs> he doesn't recommend much from the States. It's always from Asia. So this is your first time doing Fantasia Fest now. And I want to make sure you know, if you want to find more information about it, you can always go to FantasiaFestival.com. That's Fantasia, F-A-N-T-A-S-I-A, Festival.com. You know, we kind of came into this late because we wanted to cover the event as much as we could. But also August is one of, it's the final month of summer. We've got a lot going on. I think you're going through a master's program. I was actually out of the country for, for half of the event. But by God, we got some in there. We got some some films in. We got to actually sample, get a good sample of what the festival is. And what did you think of your first soiree? Your fast, what is it? Foray? Is it foray? It's foray. What, what do you think of your first foray? Soiree? Into- I think it's a soiree. Now I have no idea what I was going to say. I don't say. know what the word is either. What did you uh, think of your first tango with the Fantasia <laughs> Film Festival? Obviously, we're not dancers. So I loved it. I thought it was great. There were some really unique films. There's something different about this film festival that was unexpected for me in that, I don't know, I guess I came into it thinking it was going to be mostly horror films, and that was not the case. That wasn't the case at all. Um, obviously horror is a big piece of genre films, but they, they had a wide array. They even had a lot of animation. They had some stop motion films. They had all kinds of different things. So I really liked the diversity that they presented in the film festival lineup. This was just unique in terms of like, it had films that you normally don't see get played at film festivals, which was nice. That was refreshing. You know, I I enjoyed, it wasn't just coming of age films. Because at this point, hasn't everyone come of age by now? My God. <laughs> I mean, I I do enjoy those, but it is refreshing to go to a film festival that's not overloaded with just all of those. So were you surprised by the kind Because really, the genres are, I mean, it's horror, yes, but there's also fantasy, science fiction, thrillers, really just crime thrillers. I mean, it's really, yeah. there's something for everyone's taste at this festival. Fantasia is really leaning into the weirdness, you know, like they're proud to have some weird and unique and weird, weird, not being a bad thing, weird being an awesome thing. 
And for a film festival to say, no, we're going to play whatever we want. We're going to play some really different things that people might generally turn their heads and say, oh, I'm not going to just willingly go check that out. Like, that's not something you're going to see at the movie theater. But it's still a really cool concept. It's it's cleverly constructed. It's wonderfully performed. Like, they have all of these different types of, of movies for all different movie lovers, like you mentioned. But they're so different and and I think that's one of my biggest takeaways and one of the things that I would say from a fan's perspective why they should go is that the film festival is definitely for genre movie lovers, but it's more than that. It, it's you never feel like you've seen these before because they're so unique. Like I cannot recall sitting in any of these movies that I watched and feeling like, oh, I've seen this plot before or I've seen all of this happen before in another movie. Or that there's another film in the lineup that is similar. They're just so different. Yeah, very unique. Very unique festival. I I really dug it. And it's our first time covering it. And I got to tell you, I, I walked away going, I wish I could have been live at one of these in the past. Because it just feels like it would be a fantastic festival to be at. Yeah, I, I can't imagine how interesting it would be, especially because you have to anticipate that the people who are attending Fantasia Film Festival are also just as weird as some of the content creators. In a good way, I feel like I have to preface that because weird has such a negative connotation, but I mean that awesome. Like, I wonder if going into King Knight, if there would have been a bunch of people dressed up for it, or going into <laughs> Hellbender, for example, which is a witchcraft movie, if people would have dressed up as like witches and stuff like this is the film festival, I can see that kind of stuff happening at. Almost like a Comic-Con kind of vibe, huh? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That would be amazing. So one more thing before we move on, is there a type of film that you wished you would have seen at the festival or one you really wanted to catch? I know we're going to talk a little bit about some of the buzzworthy films that everybody's talking about that maybe we didn't get to see, but is there like a really weird one that you wanted to see or is there a type of film that you thought was missing from the festival? Uh, well, I mean, like I said, I was limited because of time. I mean, it, the festival actually ran from what's it, August 5th to the 25th, I think. 25th. Yeah. yeah. And I, I mean, that seems like, well, wow, you got all the time in the world. Well, yeah, but you also have work and <laughs> other projects going on and other reviews that have to be written. And I was also out of the country for 10 of those days. So it, it made it difficult to catch some of the stuff I wanted to catch because some of the, especially when it comes to the press screenings, they have scheduled screenings for the big ones. And what that means is you have a limited time to watch them. And at least four of the ones I wanted to see were during that time I was gone. So there was a lot that I couldn't see or I didn't get time to see. A lot of the, the Japanese films I wanted to to try to get through some of those. And I didn't really get as much time for that as I wanted. But but overall, I, I really feel like I saw what I wanted to see. We're li more limited on digital because they had more screenings on site, obviously, during the festival. But I was able to see most of what I wanted to see. Martyr's Land is really the big one I wanted to see, and I, I didn't get a chance to because of the schedule that was there. And Seal Bach is one I wanted to see that I didn't get a chance to. But overall, I mean, I, I kind of got through the ones I wanted. And King Knight was the, since you mentioned that one, that was a fun surprise. Because <laughs> I that just looked like something that I had no interest in and watched it just because, all right, it reads weird, and I can't go into a festival where weird as king and i don't watch one of the weirdest sounding ones and by god it was weird yeah <laughs> in it a good way it was yeah what about you well so i and i know this sounds super cliche and it very much so is and i'm fully aware of that but i was really hoping i'd see some slasher films mm. just because i feel like you can do something really weird with those or i was hoping somebody might do something really weird or fun or campy like i was really hoping for like a campy slasher film because we haven't had enough of those I know. No, we definitely have. That's why I say it's a complete cliche. I was just looking forward to that. Not to say that I, I was underwhelmed with any of the other content because it was amazing. And I kind of forgot that that's what I was looking at, you know, just initially anticipated seeing, but it wasn't there. But one of the things that one of the movies that I really wanted to check out is Junkhead, which is that Japanese stop animation film that I was hearing a little bit about. And even Guillermo del Toro thought it was amazing. 
But it's a basically like it's set in the future and humans have been abandoned and there's these clones that are out there. It just sounded really weird and really interesting and a stop motion animation film from a Japan sounds pretty awesome. <laughs> All right, well, let's talk about the movies you were able to see at the festival, as well as your experience doing that. Now, keep in mind, this was digital, so it's not as, as it, I don't want to say exciting, because it is still exciting, but it's not as involved as it is if you were alive. You know, you're not you're not feeling the fan reactions. You're not right. hearing the filmmakers firsthand and their explanation of why they've made certain choices. I mean, there is some Q&As, obviously, with the digital aspects, but it's not the same as being there. I, I think everyone can agree with that. So just what you thought of the experiences based on how you use the portal that we use digitally and, you know, would you like that as an option going forward? You know, do you think that the digital way is a way for people to experience a film festival without having to get out out there in the open? Well, it certainly makes it more accessible to people who don't have the ability to travel. Sure. You know, like, let's say we're out of COVID <laughs> and this isn't something that anybody has to worry about. Let's say, Amanda, Th let's say. Yeah, let's hope. I don't know. We're This is all just hypothetical. But in the perfect world, people don't have to worry about money or work or anything like that. And so that's not the reality. People do have to worry about their own commitments and it's really hard to travel. This film festival does go for um, like three weeks. So it makes it even more difficult for people to see everything that they would want to. So especially for this film festival, I think it's incredible to offer it in a digital platform, even going forward, if they resume the in person as like, they're doing both of them. I do realize it's a lot more work on the film festival side of things. But I think that's a great option to offer to people who can't make the travel, or you know, just don't have the opportunity. And it also makes it more accessible for critics. You know, some of them, you know, I know a lot of writers who are very poor, and they only do it because they love writing. And so if you can make it more accessible to them, then that's even better. Uh, not to mention, there's some people who physically can't make it for whatever reason, whether it yeah. be because of COVID or because of physical limitations. So it does open up some options for people. And they're yeah. they're pretty good about making sure that you're not going to pirate this thing. I mean, it's going to have your name all over it. Yeah, it literally has your email address right on the movie. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, we're going to get into the reviews of the ones we did see and try to remember that we rate our films on if $10 is the full price of admission, what do you give it? So essentially, if you've never listened before, one out of 10. One out of 10. 10 being the best. 10 being the best. Okay, so here we go. We're going to start with Agnes. And this is a film that Aaron caught... It's about the overflowing floral arrangements, taxidermy lions, and frosted cakes serve as the backdrop for this dreamy film about a priest and a neophyte sent to investigate rumors of demonic possession at a covenant. Or a at convent. A coven. Convent. That's the word. That's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> Two different for. things. Although what now I kind of want to see doing? that version too. <laughs> the odd pairing matches a descendant. Oh my God, I can't talk today. A descendant of a priest? That's even yes, better. This movie's changing dissident. by the second. We're doing fantastic. <laughs> Get me out of here. The odd pairing matches a dissident priest with a bright eyed, innocent Benjamin both of whom will be met with temptation as the strange goings on at the convent test their faith and that of a specific nun, Agnes. I like how like, as you went on, you started just doing a word at a time to make I'm sure. I'm trying not to mess this all up, man. Okay. Like we, We're at the beginning and I've already ruined the entire podcast. I, so. I think for sure. I, I think if they're, if they're listening, <laughs> that's Amanda at the HollywoodOutsider.com. Oh Director God, this Mickey is Reese. embarrassing. Just you know. One of the things that I was really excited about with this film and unfortunately didn't get a chance to see it, but Molly C. Quinn is in this film and she was one of the leads in Castle with Nathan Fillion. And she was always one of those standout actresses in the show that I was like, God, I love her, her energy and the way she performs and everything about her. Is she just as, because she was kind of like a bright light in the TV show, but this is about like darkness and possession and nuns. Am I getting that vibe here from her or no? Yeah. And it's not about 
her a hundred percent. I mean, she's a primary oh, okay. factor, and she's not Agnes. Just to let you know, spoiler alert. I don't know, but <laughs> Haley McFarland is actually Agnes. Molly C. Quinn is. She plays Mary, who's a nun. Man, it's tricky because where the film goes, I don't want to spoil anything for people that eventually will see it. But yes, it starts very much as priests who are investigating a possible demonic possession and how they address it. And there are underlying issues, crisis of faith, that sort of thing. And then it kind of flows into a different kind of movie as it goes on. So I I will say, like, if you think it's going to be The Conjuring, it is not. It is not a straight up horror movie. It is more a nun experienced, a life experienced through the eyes of a nun story. Oh, okay. Kind of. It it really takes different paths. And I really don't want to say too much because if you were to ever see it, I want you to be able to experience it without uh, heavy spoilers. But Molly C. Quinn's character is kind of a minor character in the front half and becomes a more primary character in the back half. In fact, she mostly carries the back half of the film. And yes, she's very good. It was nice to see her in a more adult role where she actually got to, I mean, cause her character goes through some layers and she got to play with that a little bit, which was nice. And I was a castle fan too. So it was good to see her evolving as an actress or at least being able to demonstrate her evolution. Awesome. So if the full price of admission were $10, what are you giving Agnes? Uh, I give it about five fifty. It's it, the ending didn't really click for me. I think it might be different for other people. Other people might find, um, a, you know, roads may vary, that sort of thing. Sean Gunn's in it. You know, he he drops oh, by okay. in a small role, which is <laughs> but a very pivotal role, and that's that's very interesting. I found some of the the other quirkier characters. Chris Browning and uh, he plays Father Black, who's kind of this priest who's almost like a rolling stone. I mean, he's like a rock and roll priest and he's fun, but it's a very very small role. So there's, there's a lot of fun stuff here. A lot of which I can't say without really ruining the film, but I will say it is a very non linear. I mean, yeah, I would would call it non linear because the, the, the events that happen aren't necessarily in the order you would expect them to happen in. And it doesn't follow a traditional screenplay trajectory. So I enjoyed the film overall. The ending is a little less impactful than I would have preferred or had had stronger closure, I think, for me personally. But I I do think if you're interested just in whatever the hell I've been saying while I'm trying to avoid all the spoilers, I think you should check out Agnes whenever you can. Awesome. Okay. Now let's try something a little different. Uh, Ultrasound. This is about a man whose car breaks down. Glenn spends one hell of an odd night with a married couple after his car breaks down, setting into motion a chain of events that alter their lives, plus those of several random strangers. Now, it's directed by Rob Schroeder and stars Vincent Carthiser mm-hmm. and Chelsea Lopez. So tell me about Ultrasound. I, I don't know anything about this one. This is one that I don't know much about. So is it what kind of film is this? Is it a thriller then or is it? It's really twisted. (laughs) It's weird and not twisted. And like it's I mean, it is super messed up, but it is completely opposite of what you're going to expect when you go into the film, especially in the beginning. So essentially, this man, he shows up at this door and he is like, you know, hey, my car broke down. Can I get some help? And and they're like, well, why don't you just come inside? And so he comes (laughs) inside and things really just escalate from there because it goes from. I need help to, am I trapped in here? And what do these people want from me? And why does he want me to maybe have sex with his wife? This is all in like the first five minutes. And You're selling me. I mean, if this is the pitch, (laughs) I'm in so far. (laughs) It really devolves into this very psychologically taunting type of film because you're not sure what's reality, what's what's truth, what's really happening here. And there's a little bit of a sci-fi element to it. And I don't want to say much more than that because I don't want to lead anyone to the conclusion of the story because the reveal is really cool. I really enjoyed it. And Vincent Carthizer is actually, he was Connor in Angel, if you mm-hmm. remember him. And so it was yeah. nice to or see him in, not- Or he was in Mad Men, one of the most popular or, or shows of, of the past couple decades, but he was also <laughs> Connor in Angel. 
Well, that's what I that's what I care about him for. So, <laughs> but, but for me, because I I was not I watched a few episodes of Mad Men and wasn't sold on and don't hate me. But Vincent has been an actor that he he was very his character. This is not the actor. The character of Connor was very like whiny and like very childish, which was intentional. Because he was kind of a child, even though he was an adult. And so here we get to see, uh, I think, similar to Molly C. Quinn, the evolution of growing up in terms of a character and the actor being represented in these roles, where he's in a very adult role. He's very confused. And I fully felt the emotions of what he's going through. And as the movie progresses, you get kind of a co-lead into the film, which is Chelsea Lopez. and. It's hard to say too much more about it because I just don't want to take any of the experience away. I would highly recommend it, mostly because of the bizarre twist at the end. And I was fully not expecting it to be what it turned out to be. And the twist works. So if you go back and rewatch it, it's still going to work for you? Yes. (laughs) Okay. That's the best part. If you're going to mention a twist, uh, that's the important part. Once the twist happens, you're like... Are you kidding me? How did I not pick this up? And maybe somebody will pick it up faster than I did. I certainly did not pick it up in the beginning, in the middle, or in the end. And the way well, that I hope it you picked dev- it up in the end because that's oh, where well, it was. Uh, yeah, but I'm saying until that <laughs> moment happened, it wasn't even like five minutes before. You know, right. sometimes when they get close to the reveal, it's like, oh, I figured it out. No, it happened, and I was like, brain started working. The light bulb bulb came on, and I was like, oh, okay. So, so he was dead the whole time. No. Oh, darn. I was trying to guess. No. I mean, that's the only big twist I can think of. No, no, no. It was actually clever. You know, Rob Schroeder did a nice job as the writer in putting together a story that it keeps you guessing, but you don't realize that you're really guessing the whole time is what it feels like. So it's almost like it's messing with you as much as, as the characters are being messed with. I love that. Mm-hmm. All right. So what do you give them? What's the score for Ultrasound? I gave that one six bucks. That's good. That's good. Yeah. It's like three stars out of four, five, basically. I don't even know our own <laughs> good system. Good job on the math. I don't even know our own system anymore. <laughs> you saw Paul Dude's D O O D, mm-hmm. Deadly Lunch Break. A weedy charity shop worker is set on winning the big national talent show, but when the auctions of five selfish people cause him to miss his audition, he sets out to seek deathly revenge. It's one lunch break, five spectacular murders. <laughs> yes. What? <laughs> yep, that, that happened. It is a surprisingly charming film. Is it ridiculous? It sounds a little ridiculous. It's definitely ridiculous, but it's also surprisingly charming. And Tom Mateen plays Paul Dude. And he, put it this way, he's basically one of these people that wants to go on like an American Idol kind of show or America's Got Talent, show he has talent, become a star. And he's been working on it for the longest time. And his mother has been nothing but supportive. June Watson plays his mom, Julie, nothing but supportive. And the time comes and he has the date wrong. So he's rushing to try to get to this audition to win this contest Mm. and be famous because that's all he's wanted to do forever. He wants to be, he knows he's more than he is. And his mom believes in him, which is all beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. And that means something. It does. It's really sweet. And she demands to go with him because it's so important for her to be. And he wants her there. Like, he wants her there. Aww. So they're trying to get to the audition. And then it's basically like four or five people that cause him to miss this audition or to 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 not do well at this audition. And that's when he wants to, he plots to, I don't want to say what else happens, but he plots to kill them because of it. <laughs> and everything goes right and wrong at the same time. It's kind of gruesome. Like all the murders are ridiculously over the top and also funny <laughs> and also charming. Like Tom Mateen is really like a guy you want, I end up rooting for him to kill these people. I, I get it. <laughs> I'm on board. Aww. Yeah, I'm with him. And it's uh, it's surprisingly charming, very Shaun of the Dead type humor in that respect. I really, really, really enjoyed it. I definitely would recommend Paul Dude's Deadly Lunch Break whenever it's released. It's one of those where I think it's going to be a cult classic or at least a cult hit. Huh. Yeah. And what is your score for it? Seven. Okay. Seven bucks. It's directed by Nick Gillespie. So check that one out. And it's a title you won't forget. Paul Dude's Deadly Lunch Break. <laughs> D-O-O-D. <laughs> yeah. Dude. Dude. 
All right, next up is Hellbender. Amanda saw this one, and it's about a lonely teen who discovers her family's ties to witchcraft. It stars Zelda Adams and Toby Poser. He's such a poser. So I w- <laughs> It's a woman, but okay. <laughs> wow. You just killed my <laughs> joke. I did not see this movie. So this is, I believe, going to Shudder, right? Yeah, it Way is. I understand it? All right. So tell me about Hellbender, because I will say I was reading a lot of reaction. A lot of people love this movie. But I know you were kind of more like it was good, dish. You weren't you weren't in the love fest, but you didn't dislike it. So I'm kind of I'm curious. What are the raves talking about? Do you see what what other people are raving about, and maybe you just feel differently about it, or did you just feel like eh, I just don't think it? Hit. Yeah, I can fully explain the disconnect for me. Okay, and I will start by saying that this film's going to stream in North America, the UK, Ireland, Australia, and New Zealand in early 2022. So there's not a solidified date yet, but Shutter has snapped it up, and they're going to premiere it in early 2022. The difference for me is this is a very specific subgenre of witchy movies that is that have been coming out over the past like four or five years and have become very popular. I, however, am I'm I have a hard time enjoying the movies that are just they seem so weird just for the sake of being weird at times. And I'm not saying that that's the entire film here. It is definitely weird. It's something that I would anticipate coming from A24, to be completely honest, if that gives you an indication of some of the weird qualities of it. Well, it's that could more... still go either way. <laughs> it could. I know. Yeah. I know. It's it's hit or miss for me when it comes to witchcraft movies, because this film is about this lonely, isolated girl who... She has no friends. She has nobody but her mother. They're in a band together, which is really cool. The music's kind of fun for that also. I really liked that. And she's kind of blissfully unaware of what else is out there. They live in the woods. They have acres and acres of land. So she experiences nature and she gets to kind of just connect with things in that way. And she has no idea about this history of witchcraft in her family until something happens, she meets other people, and she starts to kind of crawl out of her shell a little bit. And certain circumstances happen, and she tries to understand what's going on. And And I don't want to say much more than that. It does end with like a really cool uh, turn of events at the end of the film, which I was like, whoa, okay, we're going here. That's kind of cool. But the practice of not the practice, but the the way that they portray the witchcraft side of things, it just got really weird, like really weird. Like they're eating dinner and they don't eat anything but like a few pieces of leaves from outside, like literal leaves. And I'm just like, what's what's the purpose of eating leaves? Like, are they you can vegan make a- witches? They are. <laughs> but they that's are, very but vegan. I mean, we can only have it's three like vegan, leaves. They're eating an acorn at one point, and I'm like, okay, I feel I understand the point you're trying to get across, but it feels like you're going to the extremes, like trying too hard. Yes, uh. and and that's fine for some people. I know a a lot of movie lovers that really enjoy when a movie goes so far into the weirdness. And they never come back. (laughs) Like, they stay in the weird and they never come back. And that's fine. This is a movie I know a lot of people will enjoy. And they're going to enjoy it a lot. I was like, yeah, it was okay. If that makes sense. (laughs) It makes sense. It makes sense. But like I said, I saw a lot of raves about it. And I also saw a lot of, okay. So, I I mean, there's definitely a disconnect. And if you hear this and you kind of get a little excited, I would say, check it out. Right. I mean, obviously definitely there's some chance that you might love it, but you've also, you also watch like every witchcraft movie that comes along. So maybe you have a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it doesn't feel unique anymore. It used to be like, you could do something really clever with witchcraft. You could have something fun to it, something new to it. This didn't feel entirely new in terms of that side of things. It's where the story goes to that feels unique and different. So, I don't know. I felt like it was kind of playing on the popularity, the kind of like the cult following of some of these 
subgenre films in the witchcraft area. Okay, so if ten dollars full price for mission, what do you give Hellbender? That's coming out soon. I give it five bucks, and I will say this is really unique in a different way because the director is John Adams, Zelda Adams, and Toby Poser, two of which are the stars of the film, and it's actually a family movie. So oh. Zelda and John, they're related, and then I, what I presume is the sister of Zelda, Lulu, she's actually one of the stars in the film, too. So I what? thought that was kind of cool, like a family film. <laughs> It makes it cheaper. Yeah, it does. It makes it cheaper. <laughs> hey, I'm going to pay you in life lessons. All right, Dad, I got it. Sure. I'm going to pay you with a roof over your head, and you're <laughs> going to make this movie and do some really weird stuff, but I you and your mom are going to be in a rock band, so that's cool. They should they should do that more often. That's really what Disney should have done with Scarlett Johansson. It could have changed the whole outcome. Just yeah, right. pay your rent. <laughs> Lots of rent. All right, let's move on to baby money. Yeah, so this is one Aaron saw. I did. Minnie, Fear of the Walking Dead's Danae Garcia, is pregnant, which could be great news, right? Not exactly. This was an unexpected and not exactly welcome pregnancy, but she and her boyfriend, Gil, love each other and are sticking with it. But babies are expensive. Yes, they are. And neither's prospects are the best. So a quick break in with Tony and Dom, and they're in for some quick money to help start a new life together. The job goes south real fast, however, and Dom and Gil are on the run real quick. They find themselves hiding out in the home of Heidi, a nurse who treated Minnie and her cerebral palsy-afflicted aff- son, Chris. Now, they're all in a hostage situation with a hot property they need to sell off as fast as they can to try to make it the hell out of there before the cops find them. It's not how anyone wanted this to go, but this is what you have to do to make baby money these days. <laughs> I love this description. I, I love the description too. And every time you say Dom and fast, and I'm like, family. It's family. family. <laughs> this is all about family, it's truthfully. All about family. So, this film, Baby Money, it sounds like it's got a lot happening in the plot, but it mostly sounds like a thriller and definitely the crime aspect of it. Is it fun? Is it intriguing? Did you care about this these, this couple trying to get money for their upcoming baby? Uh, n- no. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a, it's a forgettable thriller. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to make anybody sad if you're listening and you're one of the filmmakers. It's a fine enough film. Like, it's a watchable film. It's definitely forgettable, though. You're not going to remember much after you watch it. You know, it's just something that where you, all right, I was entertained. I'm good. I'll move on. I it, It's kind of hard to root for Minnie, even though she's a star. Not for any particular reason. I mean, she's pregnant. You would think that gives you instant carte blanche, but not really. Uh, you're still participating in this robbery. You're still participating in this event that leads to them basically taking a woman and her her son who has uh, cerebral palsy hostage. And I just think like it's hard for me to root for anyone surrounding that situation. You know what I mean? At that point, I'm just like, uh, I'm only with the woman and her son. Who I I think they're both played very well. Ta- Taja V. Simpson plays Heidi, and Vernon Taylor third plays Chris, and he does have palsy in real life. Th- those two I was rooting for the whole movie. The criminals, you know, it's basically one of those movies where you have a criminal commits crime, and then they go and they're trying to hide out from the cops for the night. They're just trying to stay with us, and maybe the the people that you held hostage will suddenly help them or maybe they won't or maybe they'll turn them in you know what kind of movie is it going to be and you're kind of waiting for that to play out it it is pretty predictable in terms of how it ends which probably is what leads to it being forgettable but it was still i mean it wasn't a bad film or anything it's just if this is one of the few movies that i saw at the festival where i felt like i've seen this before mm, okay yeah you certainly did not sell me on it but there are some really great talent in the film. So if somebody is interested in maybe those actors, sure. do they still perform to the to the quality that you'd expect if you'd seen them in something before? Yeah, like I said, there's nothing bad about it. It's just, it's a very forgettable movie for me. I feel like I've seen it before. But if somebody were to say, is it worth a watch? I mean, yeah, if it's on, sure. Would I venture out to the theater? No, I wouldn't. So if the full price of admission were $10, what are you giving baby money? I'd probably give it four. 450. Okay. All right. Yep. They're not going to be providing much for that child then if they're getting your admission money. 
<laughs> Sometimes kids got to learn how to fend for themselves. Man, that's what I say. <laughs> Even their own diapers. <laughs> time to earn your own baby money. Take care of your own. It's a great time to learn self-reliance. That's what I say. <laughs> oh, All right. God. Now we've got broadcast signal intrusion. In the late 90s, a video archivist unearths a series of sinister pirate broadcasts and becomes obsessed with uncovering the dark conspiracy behind them. Did I read that right? Pirate broadcasts? Yeah, not not pirates. Oh, like pirating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, what? Johnny Depp? What are you talking about? <laughs> what? Yes. Actual pirate broadcasts. Things that were done... On the own, they basically in the 90s, I think Max Headroom, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but essentially taking over a signal and throwing your video into the middle of a TV show mm-hmm. that's going on. So it's it's a way to interrupt the signal with whatever your agenda is. That's what they're looking at. That makes sense with the title of it, Broadcast Central Much more than, yeah, 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 yeah. So what is, what is what this? What a nerd. <laughs> What is this film like for you? Was it was it thrilling? Was it scary? I mean, when you have a midnighter, um, they can go in so many different directions. Yeah, they can. It, it's definitely in the guise of a thriller, and it's kind of a mystery. You're trying to put the pieces together. I would say it's in the vein of Sinister, Okay, where you're watching different clips, and they're trying to figure out. He's trying to put the pieces together. Harry Shum Jr. from Crazy Rich Asians is in this. He's trying to put the pieces together. I love him. He's so awesome. Such a good he's, actor. he's really good. He is trying to figure out what happened. He just becomes obsessed with it. Mm. It costs him a lot because he's he's doing everything he can to find out exactly what's going on. And he also gets assistance from from Kelly Mack along the way. And you know, I it's a it's a thriller. I want to say it runs in that uh, sinister nine millimeter kind of dark and gritty. 90s vibe where it's mm-hmm. just trying to figure out what's going on. I don't know if the payoff is quite as powerful as it should have been. Ah. Uh, and I actually, I don't think the videos are quite as sinister huh, as they could be. <laughs> I just, I wasn't really unnerved by them more. I mean, because once you see them, it's basically a person in a mask and you're trying to figure out like, what are they trying to tell us? And there are moments where it's unnerving and moments where it should be. That makes sense where it's yeah. not, it doesn't quite come across as dark as it should. And that's where I think the movie kind of loses a little footing. And the ending is very, I don't want to say open-ended because there is a conclusion. It's just, it's not as definitive as I think some people will like. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So, so it's is- really going to, dep- I think a lot of how your enjoyment is going to be how you feel about definitive endings because it's very kind of like the little things. Remember the little things? Yeah. It's in that kind of vein. So it's going to be a lot of it up to you, what okay. you think. Okay. Hmm. I mean, it sounds interesting. It, it sounds is interesting. Like Absolutely. It's worth the viewing. It's just don't get your expectations up too high sort of thing. Be be open to the possibility that you're not going to like how it ends. Okay. All right. So what but are- But I love the little things and a lot of people hated that ending. So So what are you giving broadcast for a score? Uh, 550. Okay. Yep. Next up, we have The Righteous, which I know is a film Aaron was really looking forward to seeing and completely loved, spoiler alert. But The Righteous takes full advantage of the dreary otherworldliness of Newfoundland as it centers on a former priest who left the church to start a family, only to be gripped by tragedy after the death of his child. One night, he and his wife are visited by a younger stranger who turns their life upside down. With unexpected twists and turns, the film's destabilizing tension creeps into your bones like a damp chill you can't quite shake off. This sounds really incredible. I know it's in black and white, so... Mm -hmm. Like good and evil, black and white, yeah. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. I know that turns some people off, but is the story and the performances strong enough to keep them in if they're not a fan of black and white films? Yeah, I think that people that... Already look at it and go, oh, I don't want to watch it in black and white. I'm already not going to enjoy it, honestly. I, I just feel like it's one of those things where you're either willing to get on board or you are not. And I was. And I'll be honest, normally I don't love that either when films are shot in black and white. You know, I, I'm a big fan of saying mank stank. I just didn't enjoy that at all. <laughs> and that is the kind of epitome of when I see a filmmaker doing black and white now. I feel like it's doing it more for their own personal Ego than I do for a, a filmmaking reason. 
And this really worked for me. I, I don't know if it's because it kind of cleans the palette. It kind of keeps it very basic. It makes it feel very uh, old school in many respects in terms of like an old school thriller, an old school Hitchcock film, something like that with just more focus on the very thematic issues at hand as, as good and versus evil. And when is, when is redemption too late? When does it come too late? You know, there's a lot at play in this film and the filmmaking style was definitely something that was leaned into what was being done. That's awesome. Yeah. In The Righteous, you have some experienced talent. How did they shake up? Okay, you get Henry Zerny as Frederick Mason. He's the star of the film. Then you have Mimi Kuzik, who is Ethel Mason, his wife. And what happened is they just recently lost their child. Their child was, I want to say awarded to them, but they basically took up raising a child from a parent, a woman who couldn't raise a child on her own. And they decided to raise a child and this, the child tragically dies. So they're basically, they're processing grief. They're dealing with their grief. They're trying to figure out where to go. And Frederick used to be a man of God. Like he used to lead others in terms of God. And now he's kind of just his own man. He still has his faith and whatnot, but he is not a leader of Christ in that respect. And along comes this character named Aaron. Wonderful name. Probably the best character name of any of the films we've had. <laughs> Get out of here. Who's played by writer and director Mark O'Brien. And he starts off as this this wounded character in the woods that that Frederick comes across and he just wants to help him to get him on his way and get him out of their lives so they can get back to grieving. Well, he starts to work his way into their life and they start to have different appreciation or feelings or concerns about Aaron as a character. And as the film goes on, it's it very much becomes who do you think Aaron is? Who do you think the character is? And more importantly, who does Frederick think he is? And Henry Zerney's, Zerney's um, performance is what carries the m majority of the film. I mean, I do think Mimi Kuzik is, is very good. And Mark O'Brien is great as kind of the, the I don't want to say oddball, but the we don't know what he's going to do. We as the as the out of no out of nowhere character, as the character that could do just about anything before the end of the movie, we're not quite sure what his parameters are. But Frederick Mason as a character is the the backbone of the film, and you're completely following him. And Henry does a wonderful job of carrying that performance through. And he's been a character actor for years. He's in a lot of performances over the years where he's stood out, but it's always typically in a supporting role. And here he gets the lead and he does carry the film and he really makes it pop. Like by the end, I didn't know the choices he was going to make. And it was very important to how the film plays out, the choices that the character makes. And he makes me believe in the choices that he does ultimately decide on. Now talking just briefly about Mark O'Brien as the writer director. And mm -hmm. if you're not familiar with who he is, he was in Ready or Not, which was a great film. If you mm -hmm. haven't seen it, you absolutely should. He was in Arrival, Halt and Catch Fire. How does he work as a an, an new and up and coming director? It sounds like this is a great mark to start off with for your first feature film. <laughs> it's It's very impressive in terms of the film itself. I mean, he's done some shorts and some TV work, but this is, like you said, his first feature. And I was extremely impressed because it's very confident work. You have to be confident in your ability when you're telling a film with the themes that he's trying to tackle, because it's very much a religious theme. Like it, if, if you don't want to hear about God and good versus evil, don't watch this movie. It's not for you. If you're a devout atheist who just doesn't want to hear about this, it's not for you. It's very much about the clash between good versus evil choices. And when do you need to admit that you have not been as truthful to God and to yourself as you claim? Hmm. Things like that. Like there's a lot of crisis of faith issues here at play. And I think he has the utmost confidence in his own ability because of the way he shoots it, the impact of the film, the characters that he's created and the ultimate overlying theme of the film is, is just so deep that if it doesn't work with his filmmaking style with shooting it black and white and everything else, it just is going to look pompous or it's going to look weak. It's going to look very half-assed is the word I want to use, but it doesn't look <laughs> like that. It works. It pops. It, it really 
creates thought. It really makes you contemplate some of the the questions that are being raised and that always intrigues me and there's not enough of that going on in film these days that challenges the viewer to actually contemplate good versus evil god do i believe in god do i believe in do i believe in my belief not in god you know what i mean like it actually challenges those beliefs too interesting so if the full price of admission were ten dollars what are you giving the righteous eight bucks a great bucks. score mm-hmm. that would be four out of five stars <laughs> <laughs> Great maths yep. this time. I'm getting betters as I go. <laughs> okay, Indemnity, which is about an ex-fireman who finds himself on the run for a crime he has no memory of in this subversive, high-tension South African action thriller. I did want to see this as well, but I didn't get a chance to. But Amanda, you did see it, mm-hmm. and this looks very cool. Like, this is my kind of thriller. So what did you think of Indemnity? Well, it is a really fun thriller. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting about it is that the entire cast did their own stunts. The main actor, Jared Godolphin. Even like the guy in the back who's got like a three second part. He's doing his own stunts too. (laughs) That's that's what I'm hearing. Joe, fall on the table, Joe. (laughs) Good job. Next. At one point, the main actor, Jared Godold, is actually hanging out of a 21st story window, and that is 100% real. So I think that is that alone speaks to the passion of the entire cast, that they're wanting to do their own stunts, and they look good. It's not like, oh, I'm going to do my own stunts, and it's somebody who can't do a cartwheel who's like trying to like swing around stuff. That's not the case. Oh, like a Steven Seagal movie? <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's not that. The thing that I loved most about the film, though, is that this character, Theo, is one who is he's experienced a high level of trauma in his past. And he's really struggling with it because of deaths of people that he cared about. And the concept of PTSD is really, really well used here because there's it, it starts a conversation of like PTSD is very real. It's very real outside of just military veterans and those who are actively in the force. It's about how trauma in any form can impact you in ways that you don't even understand. And along the way, he has to try to like figure out what's going on. So I thought that was a nice compliment to this whole story where trauma can actually physically remove memories from you, you know, from your conscious yeah. mind yeah, stress yeah. so yeah they get they get pushed down and so that ties really well with the with this parallel of him not being able to remember this crime he's accused of oh, and so, so it's so not while, like it doesn't feel like it's kishy or or like cliche i mean it actually feels like it works and it's crux of the story it does yeah, okay. yeah. He, i mean he's trying to figure out what's what's going on along the way as he's trying to keep himself alive And so then there's pretty much everybody is out to get him and he's trying to stay alive. He's just trying to figure out the answers. And it's really fun in terms of the action. And it's super packed with that. But I think the story alone and the performances from Jared Godold just like stole this for me. I thought it was a really great film. I'm really sorry you didn't get to see it because it was really good. Sorry for you. (laughs) Sorry for me, too. Thanks. (laughs) But to be so fair, nod to Travis Tott, who is the writer and director. I was in Alaska, and that was pretty cool too. Just so you know, just saying. Yeah that 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 might win over. I think a movie. It might because I can still see this. You know, Alaska's yeah. I can't go back right now. So, in terms of the, of this film, you, you talk about the action and the actors doing their own stunts. Is the action riveting? Like, were there very memorable set pieces? I mean, were you just like, wow, I can't believe they did that, or was it pretty run of the mill? I would say that it's not memorable in terms of I don't walk away and say, wow, I'm thinking about that murder scene right here or, you know, a certain stunt. However, when you're watching it, it feels really cool. It feels visceral. It feels like you're involved in it. It feels like a real fight is happening when somebody fights. And when there's gun shootouts, it doesn't feel like, whoa, man, how'd you go through your entire clip? (laughs) <laughs> and you're still shooting bullets. Like, there's none of that, which so is a huge relief. it feels more genuine than yes. choreographed. Yes. In that respect. Yeah. Okay. That's good. And, and maybe that's attributed to the fact that they are doing their own stunts. Obviously, they have to be choreographed in that way. But 
you know, it's them feeling natural about who they're, they're already involved into this character. I don't know. All right. So what's your score for Indemnity? I gave it six bucks. Sweet. For those yeah. keeping score, that's three stars out of five. All right. Moving on. <laughs> Hashtag blue underscore whale. A provincial Russian town is ravaged by a wave of inexplicable teen suicides. Rebellious and sharp-witted schoolgirl Dana grieves for her younger sister, a once happy kid who suddenly withdrew and stepped in front of a train. Desperate to learn what happened, Dana explores her sister's online history, discovering a sinister social media game that encourages youths to take an escalating series of self-harm challenges, 50 tasks in 50 days. Beginning with actions designed to alienate them from friends and family, the challenge breaks its victims' lives apart to push them past any point of return. Hungry for answers and out for revenge, Dana registers for the game, opening a doorway into the cruelest of hidden online worlds, one that will jeopardize the lives of everyone she cares about. I have to ask this question, even just reading this description... As a, me- as a mental health advocate, I can see it coming. Ye- yeah. Yep, yep, yep. As somebody who teaches suicide prevention, I'm I'm trying to understand the approach that they have with suicide as the t- as the primary topic, and kids being coerced into doing it. According mm-hmm. to this description, is from what I'm understanding. Mm-hmm. Does it come across as like in a way where you think if a child were to watch this or someone who was already and I know you're not, you know, a licensed professional. This isn't any of your, you know, I something coming from there. I am not. My license has been revoked. <laughs> but you've been involved with the, you know, a suicide prevention organization. Sure. And so yep. from your perspective, does it come across as concerning, I guess, is my real question. Well, I, you know, I'm a big fan of if you're making entertainment, sometimes you got to take some swings. And if they hit, they hit. If they miss, they miss. I do think if you're someone who struggles with mental health issues, probably isn't the movie for you. Uh, just because of the subject matter, it could be like a triggering subject matter. In terms of how does it work for the film, it starts off, because I'll be honest, I mean, I had initial reactions, probably like gut reactions where I'm like, this, what the hell? Because I didn't read the description before I watched it. I just knew it was a found footage-esque kind of movie. Mm. And I'm like, all right, well, every once in a while they reinvent these and they work. So I'll give this one a shot just to be fair. Uh, and initially when you get to the point where you see her sister take her own life and then she realizes this is part of some kind of game, I'm like, ah, man, this is real dicey. I hope you make this work and don't make me, you know, wince at the whole thing, but it starts to work. I mean, if you remember on Friday, that was kind of like that Facebook movie where they used Facebook and all kinds of social media, media Mm -hmm. interactions in order to kind of showcase what was going on, like a found footage kind of way. Well, this is very similar in terms of they're using Instagram, TikTok-ish. I mean, they're not necessarily the same things, but ish kinds of devices, all kinds of social media options in order to showcase how this works and how this game works, where you have these tasks that you have to complete and they escalate and they escalate. And this girl, Dana, is determined to find out who is behind all of it because she wants to put a stop to it. And as she goes, as she completes the task, because they come, they become increasingly more and more personal and impactful in her own life. You kind of see how this game breaks down people. It basically takes people who are desperate for attention or starve for affection or interaction, or they're just, they have needs of some sort. And the game as a way of manipulating people breaking them down. It's like having a, an abusive partner, you know, in many ways, because they're doing things that will directly impact what happens next. Many people drop out of the game. Many people say that's too far. I'm not doing that. And so really only the, the more mentally wounded stay in the game. And then, you know, you kind of see how it takes a toll on people as they go. It's, I mean, it's not something where I would encourage someone who struggles with mental health to, to watch at all. Like, I don't think it's doing mental health favors. It's not a bulletin on, you know, suicide prevention. It's not, it's a movie that's strictly for entertainment. And yes, suicide is one of the aspects of it, but it's also how, how social media is breaking down people and their mental wherewithal. Like it's actually, I, I enjoyed it from, from the perspective of, 
I think it's clever. I think it's innovative. It was entertaining. Yeah, I was really interested to see where it went and how it ended. And it ends fairly strong, I thought. That's great. And so we're talking about how many youths are like the primary focus in the film? Or is it really just focused on one? Really, that... Dana is the number one focus. And then you'll okay. see other people are get involved. She has a best friend and she meets someone through the game. And her mother is still there because, you know, her mother already lost one child. She just want to lose another one. And, you know, other people who are part of the game, part of the fandom, part of the commenters and people that say mean things, encourage things, encourage mean, th- you know, basically how the internet is these days, they're all, they're just piling on in the backdrop, which is how it would be in real life. You know, I mean, honestly, if you really think about it, that's the kind of world we live in now. Like a lot of this stuff, as horrible as it might seem while I'm describing it, there wasn't anything I, I saw here that really took me too far out where I'm like, that couldn't happen in real life because people blah, blah, blah. I'm like, man, people are so desperate for adulation online these days that I could see a lot of this stuff happening. And so Anna Potimna, she's she's the one who plays Dana. She kind of carries the film, then it sounds like. She mm-hmm. has to really be strong in every capacity. And I'm... I'm a sucker for revenge films. So does this focus a lot on her getting her revenge and unwinding that way? Or does it keep kind of a balance between the mystery? No, it's primarily focused on her finding out who's behind it, but also how the game sucks you in and how she's Mm. now in the middle of it and she can't find a way out of it. Interesting. Mm -hmm, Because she's so so deep. She's deep (laughs) inside. She's on the inside. So if the full price of admission were $10, what are you giving? Hashtag blue underscore whale. Six fifty. And also, do you know where the title comes from? Well, <laughs> a blue whale. Yes. Okay. They, they just... <laughs> explain it very clearly in the, okay. in the movie. And I don't want to, because it's kind of, oh, okay. okay. Gotcha. But also, I mean, it's a very social media-esque name. Hashtag, obviously, blue underscore whale. So it's very specific. And it's also a hashtag, which means trending, you know, so. Make sense now? It sure does. So then we have Last Night at the Strip Club, which is a documentary short that Aaron watched. Uh, Toronto stripper Andrea Werhun was ousted from her club by the COVID-19 lockdown. And now she's taking business online as a muse for lonely men while struggling to realize her own creative ambitions. Oh, yeah. Talk to me about this film. It sounds like it's kind of like a female empowerment thing. Like she's doing her own thing. She's like, okay. I'm going to be ousted. I'm going to do whatever I need to to survive and run my business. And is it a sh- how short is the short? 11 minutes. Okay. That's it. And uh, if you're one of those people, there's no nudity. Don't get excited. It's it's just, <laughs> it's about uh, a dancer who kind of has to deal with COVID shutting down the in-person aspects and how she goes about trying to rebuild her career and find a different way to, to do things. That's all, that's all it is. And I just threw it on here just because to illustrate they do have a, a ton of shorts at this festival as well. And this is the first one that popped out at me that I had a, <laughs> I had a chance to check out. Oh, Granted, boy. the title sold me. I'm like, well, I'm dying to know what this is about. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's really, you know, she doesn't go to OnlyFans or something like that, which I'm not begrudging that. I'm just saying that that's not what her story is. It's just about how she is trying to rebuild her career and get financial freedom. It's it's just a it's a very short, interesting thing. You know, I'm not going to score this one. I just feel like it's worth checking out if you ever come across it. Awesome. And so next up is Ida Red, which is a film that Aaron saw. Career criminal Ida Red Walker, Oscar winner Melissa Leo, is battling a terminal illness while serving a 25 year prison sentence in the outlaw state of Oklahoma, which sounds terrible. She has little time left to live. It sounds like it gets worse. Under Ida's tutelage, her son, Wyatt Walker, played by Josh Hartnett, oh my goodness, Mm -hmm. has sustained the family business alongside his uncle, Dallas Walker, played by Frank Grillo. This just keeps getting better. When a job goes awry, local detective and Wyatt's brother-in-law, Collier, played by George Carroll, is joined by FBI agent Lawrence Twiley, played by William Forsyth. To track down the responsible party. This sounds a lot of fun. Is it? Is it a lot of fun, or is it just weird? It's. 
<laughs> weird is like your buzzword this episode, I think. Oh, uh, I need to pull it, that then. It's fun enough. I, I think there were moments where I was really waiting for it to get a little bit crazier or a little bit wilder, a little bit weirder. And it doesn't quite cross the edge. There's one specific scene where I'm like, okay, this is the moment where the movie kicks into overdrive where Frank Grillo as Dallas Walker, who is easily the highlight. Like I'm not, not, not just because I'm a Frank Grillo fan. I just, he's just the, the, the baddest ass in this whole movie. Yeah. So, I mean, it's pretty easy to stand up, but he has this scene where he is, how do I say it without really spoiling some? There's a moment where he's pretty close to murdering someone and he does a dance. That's the easiest way to say it. And it's just this wild, bonkers moment where I'm like, what the frack is going on? And it's a great scene and he's fantastic in it because it's just so out there. And I was hoping the movie would continue down that road and it kind of went back to its general thriller roots and stayed there for the rest of the movie. So it it came off the tracks a little bit and then got right back down to earth. And that was, a, so maybe it was a disappointment and that's just on my part for getting too excited for how crazy they were going to let Frank Grillo go. But overall, it's very much in the vein of a Heat-esque thriller. It's a, it's a heist movie. Okay. Okay. All right. And Josh Hartnett, it was nice to see Josh Hartnett back because I love Josh Hartnett and I feel like he hasn't been on enough doesn't? stuff lately. But he he does a very solid job as Wyatt Walker. And the film, you you know, you ultimately think it's about just doing heists and, and trying to get away with it in this small town family that kind of runs this this town. But ultimately, it's also about a, her a son wanting to see his mother again. Oh, that's kind of sweet. Yeah. So if the full price of admission were $10, what are you giving Ida Red? Uh, I give it five fifty. It is just shy of being really good. Like I said, I, I just feel like it needed to take that extra step because Grillo was there, man. He was ready to do it. Like I'm telling you, that scene is just like, what the, what the hell is happening right now? And then it never really comes back to that level. And that was, I won't say disappointment, but it wasn't a highlight when you don't come back to how good that was. Mm, Okay. And the end feels a little stretched, (laughs) a little stretched thin. Like there's a couple things that happen. I'm like, that seems dumb. Why would you do that? That's, you know, so it has those moments at the end and that's, Disappointing to a degree. Next up is Glass House. And yeah. this is Kelsey Egan's dystopian fairy tale where it follows Mother, played by Adrian Pierce, and her three daughters, Romantic B, played by Jessica Alexander, Sensible Evie, played by Anja Taljard. I'm so sorry. And Child of Nature Daisy, played by Kitty Harris who occupy the titular glass building, which has been completely sealed off to protect its occupants from a dementia-inducing toxin called the shred that's poisoning the air outside. On top of their responsibilities, sentry duty, and harvesting the extensive crops that keep them alive, the two older sisters must tend to their brother Gabe, played by Brent Vermeulen. That's close enough. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? I did it. Yeah. Who is unable to care for himself due to past exposure. Fearful of becoming like the lost souls who wander the abyss outside, the family keep a grasp on their past by performing sacred rituals. When B breaks the rules and lets an injured stranger, played by Hilton Pelser, into their midst, the family dynamic is shattered forever as hidden truths upend the illusions that women have worked so hard to protect. This sounds like it's got a mix of... Some witchiness and really cool post-apocalyptic kind of storyline where you have this disease, this toxin that's killing people off just through the air, which is kind of scary. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's a cool concept. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. So does it focus more on the post-apocalyptic type of world or is it nope. trying to keep it? Okay. It's it's so, very much focused on that. It's a central location thriller where it just takes place in the glass house and you kind of come to learn the, the circumstances ab- around the world as the film goal goes and, and the world builds up through their conversations and through what they're going through. And it was really interesting. It's, it's very reminiscent of the beguiled. If you ever saw that it's an old Clint Eastwood okay. movie uh, recently it was remade. So watch either version, I guess, but it was really in that kind of vein where you have, Several women that are kind of trapped inside this glass house and they come across a man and then choices must be made. Urges must be controlled. Things like that. Oh, 
Okay. Well, that's what I was going to kind of ask you is I get really frustrated with movies that have to have a choice made that seems really stupid just to advance the plot. And I was wondering (laughs) if B's choice to let this injured stranger come in and mess everything up seemed like a stupid choice that they made just to advance the plot or if it does work out and make sense. It... How do I say? Um, it works, and it's it's very interesting because some of some of the decisions that are made make more sense once you get to the end because there is a final kind of ah oh, moment where it all comes together. So it is something where you have to watch to the very end, not like after the credits, just to the very end of the movie to kind of get a full picture of what the whole story is and. Yeah, it it all fits. None of it feels like jammed in there or cliche. It just it's it's intriguing, it's interesting, and it makes you wonder like what would you do in this case? What would you do under these circumstances, etc. So if the full price of admission were $10, what would you pay? For Glass House, I would pay 650. It's it's a really interesting thriller, and like I said, like once it ends and you kind of get the full picture, I was I was really oh, I I had a real oh moment. I had my old face on. That came out wrong. Not in the way that, yeah. <laughs> yep, it sure did. It sure did. That came out wrong. Now, let's move on to Don't Say Its Name, which Amanda saw. And that's one I wanted to see, but I couldn't say it all the country. The small, snow-covered, indigenous community is about to see an upturn. Mining company, WEC, has just made an agreement for drilling on this tribal land, and it's looking like everyone will benefit, except the land itself. Local activist Karis is one of those protesting the deal when her voice is silenced in a hit and run that remains unsolved. So, as WEC begins their assault on the land, the land itself retaliates against WEC and all those who support it. But for local peace officer Mary Stonechild and park ranger Stacy Cole, the answer to this mystery lies in the traditions of their people and the vengeance-filled spirits that have haunted the land for generations, about which the people know one rule, don't say its name. That's a cool description. And I, I like when there's mysticism involved with my thrillers. And this seems like there's a little bit of that. And also maybe a little bit of environmental consciousness. Is that fair to say? It is. Yeah. This, this film is really focused on, aside from the creature or the thing or, you know, whatever it is that must not be named, the focus is on the effect that this mining company is making on the tribal land of this indigenous population, this community. And it's also about how their voices are being silenced in many ways because they're being silenced about what this decision is, this agreement for drilling on their tribal land, the voice being silenced about the hit and run and the unsolved mystery around that. And so you have kind of like this part mystery and part very horror. I would not say thriller. I would say horror to also being led by really incredible female leads. And I'm a sucker for that. So <laughs> Madison Walsh is the the pretty much the only police that they have available. And she can outsource and work with white police officers, but they don't really, I want to say, help as much as she is able to. And so she kind of is the police that they have available. And then you also have this really, what I would say, impactful f- performer who carries the entire film. She's the one that makes it all work for me. And her name is Sarah Liz MacArthur. And she is just incredibly talented. She was so fun to watch. She was so bold. She, you know, her character in itself is one that's like one that women would look up to or little girls would look up to to say, okay, she's not going to stand behind and say no. She's going to say, no, we're going to do this. We're going to take care of this. We're going to figure it out. I'm going to protect my community. And so I loved the elements around that and having these actual Native American performers, actors working on a story that is about the Native American community and the impact that they're having tying it all with a very scary horror element. It makes it very fun, but also kind of grounds it to our own reality. Hmm. Okay. Well, you kind of answered every question I had, but the That's the, fine. <laughs> the horror element, you talked about the performances, but the horror elements, is it a, is a graphic film? Is it a gory film? Is it more in, in your mind? Is it more 
Oh, that's a great question. It is sweet. That's what I was going very for. Very gory. Yeah, there's lots of blood. Yes. There's um, yes. You you do end up. I know some people don't like to know what this unknown, mysterious thing, person, energy, or whatever it is, is. You do get an understanding of it by the end of the film. It's not left a complete mystery. You don't have all of the details, but you have enough to know where this thing is coming from, what it is enough, and how it can kill people. So. Good deal. So what do you score? Don't say its name. I gave that one 750. I really, really enjoyed it. I came away feeling like this was something totally different. There were some really memorable scenes that I can't really describe because it would give some things away. And those two main performers were just outstanding for me. I would I would watch anything Sarah Liz MacArthur does. And I hope I said her name right. <laughs> she I'm does terrible too. With, <laughs> yeah, I she know really she does. does too. All right, we've got one more. Who who wants to lead it? You or me? You choose. You can go ahead. You're a okay. great lead. King and Knight. Such a weird movie. What makes a good witch nowadays? A good sense of spirituality and communion with nature. Devotion to a tight-knit group of like-minded free spirits. A successful Etsy shop and a sick set of tarot cards. <laughs> Living the dream alongside his beautiful life partner, Willow, who's played by Westworld's Angela Serafian. The revered... Revered? <laughs> The revered high priest. We are so bad at words today. Yeah, we really are. The revered high priest of a modern California coven, Thorn, who's played by Criminal Minds as Matthew Gray Gubbler. (laughs) He has it all, as well as a secret past that may or may not be as dark as his wardrobe. And much like the tides pursuing the moon, our past tends to follow us around. So when his beloved uncovers said secret on the night of their bell train celebrations, Thorn sets out on a soul searching journey back to his hometown okay so i'm gonna i'm gonna drop this massive spoiler it's not really a spoiler but this is the plot of the movie okay (laughs) no don't say that it takes away from the funny moment really yes it's so funny when you build up to that and then it's like that's what you're i think it's a spoiler okay well then i'll bleep it out but let okay. me tell you i didn't think when you finally see this movie i don't think that's i think it's the whole plot of the movie but it is but it's funny to figure out the plot on your own okay what else because it's so i mean that's the whole thing is this movie is so bizarre and quirky and just i mean it's very charming don't get me wrong in many ways and satirical in a lot of ways but when you get to the moment to that moment where it reveals what this really is about you everything you thought about this movie i feel like changes like you came into it and you watch it and you know that it's super weird but that's the moment where it's like okay i've solidified you're not taking yourself seriously in a fun way like we're not laughing at this movie we're laughing with this movie at how ridiculous some of it is. Most of it is. It's so absurd as comedy. It's very, I I keep explaining it like, it's what we do in the shadows, ask, but not in terms of like, well, it's the same kind of movie. It's not at all. It's not found footage or anything. It's shot very traditional. It's just the very absurdist kind of comedy where you take what you think you know about a coven of witches and then you just, you don't necessarily make fun of it. Because they're in on the joke. So it's not like we're making fun of them. It's just, it's funny how seriously they can take themselves sometimes. But also it kind of builds into this movie where it's like accepting people for who they are, despite how weird they are, how odd they are, how absurd they are. And kind of like embracing yourself. Hey, you're different. You you like weird things. You like unique things. You like to do stuff that other people call odd. Guess what? It's your right. And it doesn't make you so odd. And I thought I found that actually a very fascinating kind of empowering structure. You know what I mean? It's weird. It's funny. We keep saying weird. God, that <laughs> we start paying a quarter every time we say like swear drawer. Um, and it's 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 definitely odd, but it works and it's kind of charming and and has a, a real strong heart to it. Yeah, there's <laughs> there's a scene at the end that. I will forever have burned into my memory with Matthew Gray Goobler. And 
it's it's just some of these scenes that you get to and you watch these performers, these actors portray the very I don't know, they're kind of pompous characters in a way, too, because they take themselves so seriously, but it's intended to be that way. Mm -hmm. And to Aaron's point, it's like they do these very extreme satirical scenes to try to get you to laugh and to get you to to laugh at yourselves a little bit and to say, you don't have to take yourselves this seriously either. Like, do whatever you want, be who you are, accept who you were and who you are today because that helped bring you to who you are today. And it was just, it was a lot of fun. But I was also, really impressed. Re, but also relax. Just yes, relax. relax. You are way too serious. It's really how I've, like, I feel like the movie's saying to everybody who is just gets so pent up and, and accept me for who I am, though, those kinds of strong, not that there's anything wrong with that. I think that's great. Definitely accept people for who they are, but it's those people who love to shout at other people that, and the movie is kind of saying, be who you are, but calm down. <laughs> like, and also just be to who people who, who have these expectations of everyone around them to be like them sure. and to yeah. be a certain way. It's saying, just get the hell out of here, man. <laughs> like nobody cares about that. In the end, none of this matters. Like just just do whatever you want and in the most fun and creative way i could have imagined and some great one liners like some great like throw almost tossed aside jokes where it's just like where did yes. that come from well, that came out yes. of nowhere and i'm laughing my ass off and there there's a lot of that in this movie it's and like i said it's called king knight and i i can't recommend this one enough definitely i i applaud richard bates junior for this film and I will say, like, without spoiling Amanda, there's a thing that happens on a dance floor that I'm just like, this That's is... That's what I was referring to. Oh, is it? It's the same yes. thing. It's like, is this happening? This <laughs> is happening. happening. Oh, my God, it's happening. <laughs> and it was fantastic. I just absolutely loved it. It was fantastic. This movie made me wish that I was, like, a little bit high while I was watching it, just so I could laugh a little bit deeper or a little bit harder. I felt like they were. Everybody involved they, was, yeah. But not in like a Seth Rogen kind of way, <laughs> no, which is no. not anything bad, but no. in a very different way. Very creative. So what's the admission price you would give it if the admission were $10? Uh, dollars seven fifty, because it's definitely stuck with me. Yeah, I give it eight bucks. So we both really enjoyed it. Woohoo. And that's the last one we're reviewing. Hey, you guys are still here. Whew, thank goodness. That's a That's a long one. Now we're going to do our own little Fantasia Fest awards because the, the event themselves does their own awards. You can find those at FantasiaFestival.com, but we're going to do ours. So the most unique film you saw, Amanda? That would definitely have to be Ultrasound. That one just, it took me by surprise and I mentioned how twisty it is and how it psychologically taunts the audience. And so uh, definitely a big award for uniqueness. I'm going probably with Blue Whale. Just okay. Just because, even though it's not my favorite movie of the festival, they try so many different things, and like I said, it's a really touchy subject, and they still made it entertaining. That's hard to do. So I, I found it very unique, and obviously some of these tools have been used in other films, but they make them all work, and that's hard to do. It's very hard to do. Best new director for me, King Knight. Because yeah, and I don't know. Well, if it's he's not new. a new director. He's not new. To, he's new to me. Is what I'm saying. Okay. Like he's new to me. So he's not a, a, a director that was on my radar, Richard Bates Jr. But now he officially is in terms of very much. And I keep saying what we do in the shadows. Very much how I was not really a Taika Waititi fan until what we do in the shadows. Then suddenly I'm all on board the Waititi train. Same thing with Richard Bates here. Mine is Ruben Martel for "Don't Say Its Name" mm, because it just. He's a filmmaker now based on that film that you would definitely watch whatever he does next. Definitely. Yeah, it was it was really different and it stayed. I don't know. I, I feel like it's really hard to try to make a film that would be able to connect with Native American audiences and gives them something and gives them power. And this felt like if I were Native American watching this, I would feel powerful from it. You know what I mean? Mm hmm. Now, what was your favorite overall performance? Oh, this is the easiest one for me. 
Matthew Gray Goobler for <laughs> King Knight. Just, seconded, seconded. Yes, he was so amazing. And and I've loved him for years. I've, he's so creative and and he is very quirky as an individual, but his character, he just like fully went for it. And I cannot love and appreciate that enough. Yeah. Uh, there is a, a very difficult thing that is prominent in comedies where if it's, if they're playing a character that is so ridiculous and they can still never crack a smile, <laughs> never let it show that they're in on it. You know, Mike Myers has some great characters, but I never not see them and feel like he he's not in on that joke. You know, like he kind of always makes a little smile or laughs or something and giggle. Like he does not break character here, like the entire film and the entire film. I'm just like, there's got to be a moment where he just he's got to let it go. And nope, he never breaks character. And it was freaking fantastic. It was just fantastic. Okay, well, that is going to do it for our festival. Thank you, everybody, for listening. I hope you enjoyed this. Remember, you can go to FantasiaFestival.com for more information. That's FantasiaFestival.com for more information. We'll obviously be back next week with a new episode where we're going to wrap up summer and also talk about Shang-Chi and The Legend of the Ten Rings. Now, there's a lot of films that debuted at Fantasia Fest. Please go to the site itself and look for a lot of these films. They're going to be coming out as... The year progresses, hopefully. I mean, some of them are still looking for distribution. Some of them are coming out very soon. So just keep your eyes open for some of the titles mentioned, as well as go to their site and you can find even more information. But thank you for listening. That's a lot of movies to keep an eye on. And I hope you guys did enjoy it. You can always find more information about those films at, on imdb.com as well. Maybe you can find a release date for them there as one gets set. Thanks again for listening, everyone. Be sure to subscribe. Tell your friends about The Hollywood Outsider. And remember, the next time you head to a theater, buy popcorn.